Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Dad, it's mom. Pete smiled as he took the phone from his daughter. He had a pretty good idea of what this conversation was going to be about, but it was his first conversation with his wife that morning, so he was looking forward to it. He heard his wife Jones say, Hey baby, can my sweet teddy bear oversee a dozen teenagers today? I'd like to think I can handle this. Eva and the girls have been planning this for a couple of weeks, so all I have to do is follow their instructions. She and her friends are 19 or 20, so it isn't like I'm trying to shepherd a bunch of toddlers. She asked, did you get the pool all set up the way she wanted it? He replied, yes, yes. In the lounge chairs. In the bar. In the grill. The food is prepped. I did all that while you've been gone. Next year, you get to play chaperone. Ha! Huh. Don't tell me you haven't been looking forward to this. There will be a dozen teenagers in bikinis around you all afternoon. I'm willing to bet by the time I get home, you'll be all ready for me. Well, don't forget one of those is our daughter, and two more of them are like surrogate daughters. I don't need to be around a dozen bikini-clad teenagers to be ready for you. I'm ready for you all the time, every day. I know you are, and I like that. He asked, did you have a good trip? She replied, we did. It was a good learning conference. Joan worked for a mid-sized investment firm in a Nashville, Tennessee suburb. She was a senior investment advisor and had worked there for nearly six years. That's great, sweetie. Have a safe trip back from San Jose. Thanks. I'll see you later this afternoon. Love you, Joan. Love you, Pete. Eva rolled her eyes at her dad, though truthfully, she was happy that her parents still loved each other as much as they did. She hoped she would be as in love with her spouse after 25 years of marriage. Pete was in his own mind for a moment too. Teddy Bear. He had been lover until the kids were born. Then he was daddy until their oldest went to college. He's been her teddy bear ever since. He didn't mind it too much. She certainly liked snuggling next to him. And she told him that she loved sleeping with and then next to her teddy bear. So who was he to complain? He and his daughter and her two best friends had been busy for a couple of days getting everything ready for the party. It was only two weeks before she and her friends' college classes started, junior year for most of them. Eva wanted a big party before most of them drove off to other parts of the Southeast. She was starting her junior year studying medicine at Vanderbilt University, which is about 20 miles north of her parents' house in Franklin, Tennessee. She lived with her longtime best friends in an on-campus apartment. She was a very cute girl and, like her mother, was about 5 foot 6 and curvy. Lily and Carrie, the above-mentioned best friends, spent the night and had been helping that morning, also. Lily was a tall, Slender and very attractive African-American with very pretty light pecan brown-colored skin and wonderfully long, curly hair. At 5 foot 10, she was a good inch taller than Pete, for which she teased him mercilessly. He didn't mind. He loved her and loved having her around. She was like a sister to Eva and another daughter to him. She and his daughter had been as thick as thieves since third grade. She was on a track and field scholarship at Vanderbilt, which paid for a portion of her tuition. She ran the 800-meter. 1500 meter and the mile. When she was younger, she would run some with Pete, but as she got older, he told her he couldn't run with her anymore because he was holding her back. She missed running with him. She was a very smart young lady and was majoring in math and computer science. Carrie, Eva's other best friend, was the first friend Eva made on her first day of elementary school. Carrie had dropped her sandwich that their housekeeper had made for her, and Eva gave her half of hers because her parents had always taught her to help others. When Lily came along, they became their version of the Three Musketeers because they were nearly inseparable. Carrie only made a 1300 on her SATs, but with her parents' money and old money connections, she still got into Vanderbilt. They teased her that she could have scored a 600, and she still would have been admitted. As a prank in high school, rather than being voted most likely to succeed, or some other useless award, she was voted most likely to buy an island. She was a little blonde doll with a cute figure on her tiny 5'2 frame. They were a good group, like, well, like three sisters, and Pete loved having the three of them there with him. Under the backyard pavilion and outdoor kitchen, attached to the side of the two-story pool house, all of which was mostly built by Pete over the years, they had the table ready to serve lunch, and the rest of their friends should be showing up any minute. It was a gorgeous August day, and the lounge chairs were set up, the pool was clean, and Pete had mowed and manicured the yard. Eva seemed to have inherited her mother's organizing and event planning abilities, and she had kept her father moving the last two days. She was his little girl, and she bragged on him when she had the chance. 
He tended to be more bashful than boastful and was very assured of his capabilities, but not braggadocios about them. She guessed building and running his small consulting firm would do that for some men. Not that what other men did matter to her. She knew the fathers of most of the girls coming over, and if there were a vote amongst them as to who had the best dad, hers would likely get a majority of first-place votes. After helping serve a lavish spread of food and non-alcoholic drinks, Pete said, Okay, ladies, I'm going back inside. Let me know if you need anything. Lily asked, Are you sure you don't want to stay out here and eat with us? Thanks, Lily. This is for all of you to enjoy. I'm good. This afternoon was for them, girls only. He had kept himself busy in his office, out of which he could see the pavilion and a portion of the pool. Once the girls had started taking off their cover-ups and clothes to reveal their swimsuits, he moved around to the den to watch the Braves lose another game, because he didn't want to appear to be a creeper. He had been watching for about 20 minutes when he heard a commotion out by the pool. Standing to investigate, he saw a large young man grabbing Carrie's wrist and trying to pull her away from her friends who had surrounded the two of them and were yelling for him to stop. Pete ran outside, and as he approached the group, he yelled, Hey, a-hole, let her go. The big guy, probably around six foot three, saw Pete and smirked, not even bothering to slow as he dragged a resisting Carrie towards the exit. Little Carrie didn't even weigh 115 pounds, and he was probably twice her weight. As Pete got closer, a-hole pushed Lily out of the way and as she stumbled, Pete tried to catch her, but with her tall frame, she bumped into his nose, hard. For a second, he saw stars, but then recovered, and he ran to get between Carrie, the intruder, and the gate leading towards the driveway. Let me go, Ricky, yelled Carrie. Girls, get back. All the other girls moved away from the three people involved in the altercation, but they didn't go far. Some had their phones out, filming. I said, let her go, a hole, yelled Pete. Pete stepped in close to Ricky, who decided that having 6 inches and 60 or 70 pounds on Pete meant that he didn't have to worry much about him. Since his right hand was holding Carrie's wrist, he tried to throw a left jab at Pete. That was his first mistake. Pete dodged low, and with some momentum behind him, put a solid punch into Ricky's solar plexus. A big whoosh of air rushed out of his mouth, and he hunched back, absorbing the blow and releasing Carrie. Not wasting any time, Pete put a hard knee to Ricky's nuts, which took him down to his hands and knees. Get the hell out of my backyard, a hole. Ricky slowly got to his feet and said, You aren't as big as my old man said you were. I'm going to enjoy slapping you around. The big guy prepared to take another swing at Pete, but it was telegraphed so far in advance that Pete had to wait before he could respond. It was clear this guy didn't have any training, thankfully. As Pete ducked under the big roundhouse right hook, he put his right foot behind a hole's right leg and shoved as hard as he could. Ricky was already off balance from the missed swing, and he fell backwards over Pete's leg, landing with a hard thud onto his back. When Pete said, just leave, I don't want to have to hurt you. Several of the young ladies giggled at the shorter man threatening the outmatched giant. Those giggles weren't helping. As Ricky climbed to his feet, he said, you move pretty good for a teddy bear, but my dad calls you a little teddy bear. Pete was wondering where he got his information. How would he know about? Ricky came for him again but now Pete was getting pissed. He knew he needed to end this before he lost his temper and his self-control. Ricky tried to fake a right jab, but did it poorly. When he threw a left jab, Pete dodged it. What Pete was waiting for was what came next. Another right hook that seemed to start down in Birmingham and slowly whizzed by Pete's head. As Ricky's arm went past Pete's head, he stepped in and delivered a devastating combination to A-hole's right side where his kidney and liver are located. Pete thought that was probably the hardest he had ever hit anyone with his hands. Ricky dropped like a stone. It took a solid 45 seconds just to get to his hands and knees. Nobody was giggling anymore. As he pushed himself onto his knees and prepared to stand, Pete grabbed one of A-Hole's hands, bent it behind his back, and put enough pressure on his fingers to almost break them. Once on his feet, Pete marched Ricky through the still open gate and pushed him out onto the driveway. After Pete let him go, Ricky was moving like an old crippled man holding his side. Ricky had enough fighting, but he wasn't done talking. You may call your wife your sweetie, but my dad calls her his sweet kitty. Surprised? Oh, just because she tells you she's traveling doesn't mean she is. Sometimes they stay in town so she can enjoy his big tool uninterrupted for a couple of days close to home. Pete said, yeah right? If you want to keep talking smack about my wife, we can step back into the backyard. Keep yapping, a hole. Anyway. 
I wouldn't believe you even if you said you had proof. Now that you're embarrassed, all you have is lies. Oh, we'll see about that. I'll believe it when I see it in my hand. And Pete pointed to his hand. Even then, you'll probably have someone fake it. Ricky just smirked at Pete. Looking around, Ricky found Carrie's Mercedes and banged the hood of her SUV hard enough with his fist to dent it. It was then that Pete finally noticed the sounds from all the other girls yelling and gesturing at the young man. He had been so focused a few moments ago that he didn't hear them. Ricky slumped into his BMW and left. When Pete turned around, he saw several young ladies making very unladylike gestures towards Ricky and several cell phones filming the activities. Pete said, Come on ladies, the show is over, back inside. Also, please do not share that video with anyone, yet. Let's talk about it for a few minutes first, okay? He heard Eva say, Daddy, your nose is bleeding. In the next instant, Lily was barking orders to everyone to make room for Pete on a chaise lounge chair under one of the umbrellas. Eva, go get him a clean shirt. Carrie, go get him a bag of ice. She got him sitting down and began pulling his shirt off to hold against his nose. The remaining ten girls all got a really good look at this very fit and lean man in his late forties. They never would have expected what they just witnessed. At that moment, Pete had nearly a dozen bikini-clad nurses ever so willing to help him, though with Lily running things, that was unlikely to happen. One of them ran to the pavilion to get him something to drink. Another was trying to ease him back so that he could lie down. The rest were chattering away about what happened and staring at Pete. When Carrie and Eva returned, he put the ice on his nose and asked, Who the hell was that a-hole? Who raises a piece of shit like that? Carrie, what did he want with you? Eva stepped in to answer the first two. That a-hole, as you like to call him, is Ricky Farmington, the son of Andrew Farmington, mom's boss. Oh, shit. Those earlier accusations just went from some stupid kid talking smack to maybe a stupid kid that knows something. Shit, shit, shit. He didn't want to let his concern be known to Eva nor the others. Carrie said, the reason he was after me was because we went out one time, a couple of weeks ago, and when he asked me out again, I declined. I tried to do it nicely, but he wasn't very nice about it. I'm sorry he came here. I'm not sure how he found me, but I'm guessing one of the crew here put today's party on social media. She looked at her friends and pleaded, please stop doing that. Then looking back at Pete, she asked, Mr. Clark, how did your nose start bleeding? He never touched you. Pete said, I think that was from when I tried to catch my other daughter, Lily. She fell into me and the side of her head hit my nose. He smiled at Lily. I'm so sorry, Dad. Lily had called him Dad for several years. When he pushed me, you were so close, and when you tried to catch me, we got tangled up. I didn't mean to bump your nose. Pete squeezed her hand. Don't worry, it wasn't your fault. It doesn't feel broken, just sore. Lily was pleased to hear that. Worried about the videos, Pete said. I know this is asking a lot of all of you, but please don't share a video of what happened with anyone outside of this group. No posting to social media. No emails. No texting to your friends. Nothing. Please. Why, Daddy? You didn't do anything wrong. From the looks of things, you could have really hurt him if you wanted to, said a curious Eva. He replied, in the first place, I don't want any of those smears regarding your mother being posted out there. We know they aren't true, but they still wouldn't sound good. Also, someone with that kind of temper could try to retaliate against Carrie or me or any of us if that video were posted online or started getting around. Don't you see? He would be embarrassed and want some payback. He still might. But I'd hate for one of you to be leaving a movie theater or college class at night and have him sneak up behind you and hurt you because he was angry and stupid or drunk. Sure, he would be arrested later, but with a temper like that, he could be dangerous and do some permanent damage. Eva asked, are you going to call the police? I'm afraid so. We don't have to decide about pressing charges right now, but he assaulted Carrie and Lily and tried to assault me. A couple of girls giggled at Ricky's attempt to assault the smaller man. He also damaged the hood of Carrie's SUV, not to mention trespassing, and I'm sure other things. I'll get someone to come out and take our statements. It shouldn't take long. I'm sorry, but we need to do this. You can still lay out by the pool and have your party. He asked, Carrie, is your wrist all right? Yeah, I think so. He grabbed it pretty hard, so it might bruise, but nothing else. Pete nodded. Carrie asked, Mr. C. Where did you learn how to do that? Ricky is a big guy and in good shape. I know he's won several fights. It's kind of boring. You sure you want to hear this? A dozen bikini-clad ladies were nodding their heads up and down. Not a bad sight to watch. Pete shrugged. 
When I was in high school, I was teased occasionally about my height. Both of my parents are short, too, so I knew that wasn't likely to change. I was always in good shape because I ran track in junior high and later cross country in high school. I was pretty good, too, competing in the state finals. But one night when I was a junior, I had a date with a nice girl and as we were leaving the movie theater, a couple of big a-holes, like Ricky, wanted to harass us. They did for a minute, and I tried to ignore them and push my way through. Being on a date, I didn't want to start anything, so I let them push me a little. Fortunately, I had a couple of friends that were there too. They saw what was going on, joined us, and the two a-holes left. We finished our date, and I went home. I was more than a little angry. I told my dad about it, and the next day he found a martial arts studio for me near their home in Knoxville. He told me, be the best you can be, but if you ever get good, don't go looking for trouble. Defense of you and others, only. I promised, and I took two lessons every week until I went to college at Georgia Tech. While in college in Atlanta, I found a studio that taught several other disciplines including silent, a close combat style, as well as judo and jiu-jitsu. They didn't ascribe to any single style, and their focus was on self-defense. I trained there my four years in college. The instructor was a really old guy about my height and his daughter was about Eva's size in her late 30s. He led the school, along with his daughter, and she was the most amazing fighter I've ever seen, fast, fearless, and deadly. I watched her spar against big, fast guys with black belts, and it was rare they ever laid a hand on her. And when they did, they usually wished they hadn't. I knew I wanted to learn from her. So, for four years, I took two to four lessons per week. I was pretty good for a while. He was being modest. When I married Joan, we still lived in Atlanta, but I cut back to one lesson per week. The entire time we've been married, she's never seen me in a match. She knows I practice in our basement gym, but that's it. Eva, when you started college a couple of years ago, I found a local studio and began studying again. I'm not as good as I was, but I do okay. Eva said, Daddy, I never knew. You didn't need to, sweet pea. Do you remember when we took you and Donnie to Paris when he was in ninth and you were in seventh grade? She nodded. Do you remember that night we drove out to that Moroccan restaurant in the shady-looking section of the city? She nodded again. I told your mother that I didn't want to go there because I thought it wasn't a safe place to go at night. Of course, she disagreed. The discussion was a little heated after a while, but I finally relented, like I usually do. It was a great restaurant. I enjoyed it, but do you remember what happened on our way back to the car? Eva answered, those two guys, a tall one and a short one, came up behind us and yelled at us to stop. You gave mom the car keys and told her to take us to the car, start it, and begin honking once we were inside. That's right. While the three of you got away, I was planning to stop them or slow them down. If I wasn't there right away, I knew she would call the police, though I wondered how long it would have taken for them to show up in that part of town. After you guys left, the tall one pulled out a knife and said, Money. I doubt he spoke much English besides that. I held my hands up like I didn't want any trouble but eventually he got close enough that I had to take him on. I kept him between me and the short guy. Pretty quickly, I took his knife from him and put it into the side of his knee. I'm surprised you guys didn't hear the scream he let out. When the short guy pulled his own knife, I hit him, and his knife fell away from us. Well, the tall guy screaming aroused the curiosity of several of their friends, who started running towards us. At this point, I started running towards the car hoping you guys were in it. I felt in control with the first two guys but with six or seven more coming my way, I thought discretion was the better part of valor. So, it was time for me to leave. I sprinted towards the car, and when I heard the horn, I made a beeline for it. Your mother had pulled onto the street and was ready to go. I hopped into the front seat and told her to punch it. Since she and I have been married, that is the only other time I faced anything like that before today. That was a little fib. What he didn't tell them was that one time after Donnie and Eva were born, just before they moved to Nashville, he and Joan were out dancing one night when they still lived in Atlanta and one of her former boyfriends from college, Bobby Taylor, then an Atlanta Falcons football player, approached them. Joan didn't think anything about it, but when he asked Joan to dance and she accepted, Pete was fuming. They only danced a few minutes, but later when Pete saw him go into the restroom, he followed. In the restroom, the jock, a wide receiver who was about the same height as Ricky, smirked at Pete and started making some comments about how he missed Joan and maybe they would dance a little more that evening. Pete wasn't in the mood. As the old flame was about to try and push Pete out of the way to leave the restroom, Pete put him on the floor. Hard. The big guy fell at an odd angle 
landed on his arm and broke his ulna bone at the elbow, which ended his playing time for that season. The Falcons brought in a replacement, who did so well that Bobby was later traded to another team. No charges were filed. Pete continued with Eva's friends, so please everyone, don't send that video to anyone. By the end of the day, there should be exactly 13 copies, including me, and never more than that. They all promised Pete they wouldn't send it to anyone. He hoped they meant it. I know this kind of dampens the mood, but you shouldn't let it. He's an a-hole. Forget him. Lily said, you mean he's an a-hole. Pete smiled and some of the girls laughed. He stood and returned inside to call the police. When the officer arrived, he was rewarded with all those lovely ladies in their swimsuits. They quickly covered up, and he asked them to explain what happened. He examined Carrie's wrist seeing it was still red, but no more injured than that. Pete's nose had stopped bleeding, and he had changed. Carrie's mom had come over because her dad wasn't back yet from a trip. The entire discussion only took 30 to 40 minutes. Once the police car pulled away, the party resumed. Carrie hugged her mom and watched her drive away also. Eva came up to Pete and asked, Dad, would you mind if we stayed here until we go to Carrie's? We planned on going out dancing after dinner, but after this afternoon, we prefer to dance here, tonight. It's your house, Eva. You know I don't mind. I love having you here. She hugged her father and returned to her friends. Pete caught the last inning of the Braves game. They were losing, of course. While watching, he received a text from Joan. Plane was delayed. We'll be home late. He sighed. That little seed of doubt was starting to bother him, and he hated that. Some of Ricky's words were too close to home. He needed his wife to get home so they could talk. Pete danced with a few more of Eva's friends, or more accurately, they were dancing with him. They tried to teach him the electric slide, again, but he couldn't ever quite get it right, which amused everyone, including Pete. Around 10 p.m., they needed to get to Carrie's, whose huge house had a ton of bedrooms. Pete received very nice hugs, kisses, and thank yous from all the young ladies as they left. Having had a little help, it didn't take much to clean up outside. As he was putting the last of the trash into the trash bins, he heard the garage door open. Joan was home. He walked out to help her with her bag, and she gave him a big hug and quick kiss on the lips as he approached. She said, I missed you, baby. How was the party? It was interesting. I'll tell you about that in a minute. They just left to go to Carrie's for the night. Oh, I thought they were going out dancing. He said, they decided to dance here. I'm sure you minded that. Did you turn off the lights and watch them from inside? That irritated him a bit, but he replied, no. Lily pulled me outside with her, and I danced with most of them before they left. Well, I'll bet you're in quite the mood. If I weren't so wiped out from the cross-country flight and the delays, I'd be happy to take care of you. Pete wasn't really in the mood either. He said, let me get your bag inside, and I'll pour you a glass of wine. I have quite the story to tell you. She was curious regarding what had happened and followed him in. Once he returned to the living room, she was sipping her wine and watched him sit across from her, rather than by her. Oh, this must be serious, she snickered. Pete proceeded to describe what happened, including calling the police but leaving out the dialogue from Ricky. She was shocked that someone could be so brazen as to just barge into their backyard and attack Sweet Carrie. Then Pete revealed the name of the assailant. His name is Ricky. Ricky Farmington. Andrew's Ricky. Shock. Then disbelief. Crossed Joan's face. No way. I cannot believe he would do that. There must be some mistake. Pete said, clearly, Andrew forgot to teach him a few things. Then he thought to himself, like manners, respect, how to fight, and when to keep his big trap shut. Joan thought for a second. Wait a minute. Ricky's huge. You mean to tell me that you took him out of the backyard, like trash? She giggled for a moment. Then she giggled some more, and then she started laughing. What? She said, you're making this up, right? My husband. All 165 pounds of you beat up that tank? He looks like he's almost twice your size. Okay. What's the joke? Pete was not as amused. She could see his disappointed expression and said, Oh, come on, Pete. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but be realistic here. Pete stood and said, Good night, Joan. Don't pout, sweetie. I don't mean that badly. How else could he take it? I'll be there as soon as I finish this glass. She was shocked when he replied, Don't bother. While Joan went into the kitchen to put her glass in the sink, she called to him, but he didn't reply. When she got upstairs to their bedroom, he wasn't there. He was in a guest room. She asked, Pete, what are you doing in here? I missed you and was planning on snuggling with my teddy bear tonight. Teddy bear. Now he wondered about the origin of her using that pet name. 
Was it a term of endearment or derision? He could blow up over her use of the term right then, but he was emotionally exhausted and wanted a fresh mind to think things through in the morning. He said, well, then I guess we'll both be disappointed. Then he closed the door and locked it. After a few minutes of knocking and pleading, she finally left and went to their bedroom, confused at the turn of events. Her husband must be losing his mind, she thought. She considered texting her daughter to find out more, but it was late, and she would see her in the morning. Besides, no way could her husband do what he said. It wasn't possible. The next morning, Pete knew she would sleep late after the long flight and being on West Coast time for a couple of days. He wondered if she even went on a trip, which irritated him because now he was questioning everything. He snuck into their bedroom and retrieved some clothes for running and later, changed for his run and ate a small breakfast. When he heard her beginning to stir, he went for a long run. Seven miles and just under 53 minutes later he returned. When he walked in the door, Joan did not look happy. Mister, we need to talk. I don't think you gave me the whole story last night. He ignored her and went to the shower. She was following, but once in the bathroom he locked the door behind him. She beat on the door, but he continued with his shower and shave. Once dressed and feeling refreshed, he prepared to face his wife. He went downstairs to go into his home office. She was already waiting for him. Andrew called me this morning. I'm not sure I got the entire story last night. Ricky had blood in his pee and had to go to the emergency room late yesterday. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. She said, Ricky told Andrew that he was here just talking to Carrie when out of nowhere you came up behind him and hit him in the back with something. They think you bruised a kidney. Andrew wants to file charges. Pete replied, Why am I not surprised that the little a-hole is lying about the incident? He's probably embarrassed that your little teddy bear threw him out, as you said, like garbage. Andrew's very angry. Why did you do that? Why did you attack him? The reason I attacked that poor boy was because he was attacking Carrie. You know, the Carrie that we love like our own daughter and have for over a decade. The Carrie that we took with us and Eva and Lily to Spain for two weeks to celebrate Eva's and their high school graduation. That same Carrie was being dragged out of our backyard by that unrespectful piece of shit. And I put a stop to it. Are you saying that you believe their story and not your husband? Do you believe I sucker punched him? Joan said, I'm sorry, Pete. No way could you do that face to face. Pete wanted to throw in her face how in the hell did that stupid kid know the things he knew. Pete was furious that he had to let that slide for now because all he had was a bunch of hearsay from Ricky and not enough to accuse her of anything without her easily being able to sidestep the accusation. And if true, she would be more careful in the future. The whole situation stunk. But if the accusations were true, then they were finished. So, you don't believe that I could do it face to face, man to man? No offense, honey. I love you like no one else, but he's huge and you're in great shape, but you're no match for him. Remember Paris? You were running as fast as you could with that little guy chasing you trying to get to the car before he caught you. That was after I took care of the big guy. He was never going to catch me, and I was running because. Pete stopped. This was pointless. It was already clear what she thought of him. Regaling his hard-fought and won battles wouldn't do any good. He could see it was already a lost cause likely in more ways than one. She continued, Do you have any idea how difficult this is going to make life for me? That surprised Pete. Oh, excuse me. What was I supposed to do? Would you rather I have used a gun? I would like to know what you hit him with. My hands, he replied. Bullshit. I've seen you work out in our basement gym. You go after the bag pretty good, but I don't see how you could have hurt Ricky by just hitting him. How could you have gotten a clean shot, unless you snuck up on him? Thanks for the faith, babe. It's confidence-inspiring. In case you didn't pick up on it, that was sarcasm. Exaggeratedly, she rolled her eyes and groaned. Oh, come on. That's not helping. What do I tell Andrew? You tell him that he raised his piece of shit son to be an a-hole, apparently, just like him, and that Ricky needs to apologize to Carrie and to me. I will not. Ricky told him what happened, and it sounds like he didn't do anything wrong. Pete shook his head. You must be delusional if you believe him over your husband. Did Andrew give you drugs while you were traveling? Joan's face flamed at that comment and was about to reply when they heard a vehicle drive up and honk the horn. Thankful for the reprieve, they stood to see who was there. It was a big Bentley, and out of the vehicle exited Eva, Lily, Carrie, and her dad, Brian. All three of the girls ran up and hugged Pete and then Joan. A moment later Brian came up and shook his hand. Pete, I want to thank you for looking after Carrie. It means a lot to me that you would do what you did. She's everything to me. I'll be forever grateful. Pete shrugged his shoulders, 
uncomfortable with the praise. You know we love Carrie. No way was I letting that shit leave with her. Wasn't going to happen. You would have done the same. Brian nodded his head, and Joan piped up. Girls? Would you please explain to me what happened? I'm getting conflicting versions of events from what Ricky told his dad and what Pete is telling me. Eva asked, You're getting two different stories, and you don't believe dad? Uh, well, not that, exactly. That's not what I'm saying. I'd, I'd just like to hear it from someone else. It all sounds so, I don't know, preposterous. Pete shook his head and went back inside. He wouldn't be there long. While the girls described the whole scene to Joan, Pete was grabbing his laptop and an overnight bag. He was getting away before he said something that he couldn't take back. He needed time to determine what he was going to do next. When Pete walked back outside, Brian, Carrie, and Lily were gone, and Joan was stunned. How could her husband have done that? Seeing the shock on his wife's face told him how far he had fallen. When combined with her focus on how all this affected her and her work, not him, his daughter, or Carrie, it spoke volumes. Pete asked, So, what are we going to do about that a-hole? Someone needs to teach him some manners. Joan scoffed, And you think you're going to be the one to do it? Pete couldn't believe it. She just heard three people corroborate his story and she still didn't think he was capable of handling that a-hole? She must think her husband's some kind of a coward, she said. He's probably pretty pissed. Pete smirked thinking how Ricky was probably still pissing some blood. What she said next killed him. I don't think you'd be so lucky next time. The look on Pete's face told her she had gone too far. She meant it and was just trying to protect her husband from getting hurt. How could he take on such a big, strong, young man directly? She watched as his face morphed from one of complete shock to being filled with fury. When did you lose all respect for me as a man, Joan? What? You didn't used to treat me this way. You used to have some faith in me. I see that's gone now. You're being ridiculous. My feelings for you haven't changed. I'm proud of you and everything we've done together. Well, call me skeptical. Did you know that I have C-level people from several Fortune 500 companies in my contacts app? These people call me and my company when they need help. That's how I make our living. My company may not make as much as Andrew's, but my people and I get a hell of a lot of respect within our industry. Apparently, a lot more respect than I get at home. These last couple of days have been very educational when it comes to what you think of me. What does that mean? Not for you to worry about. I've made a decision. If that piece of shit, either one, him or his father, isn't here tomorrow at 6 p.m. to apologize to me and Carrie, then Brian and I will call the police and press charges. He needs to pay for the hood of her SUV, also. You can't be serious. I still have to work with Andrew. Well, maybe you can convince him that he should teach his son some manners and that he should respect others. Clearly, he hasn't learned that from his dad, but I'm sure you know that by now since you have to spend so much time around him. Pete, this could hurt my job. Well, Joan, look at what this is doing to us, but it doesn't appear that you see it that way. Tomorrow, 6 p.m., or Brian and I are calling the police. I'm going out for a while. No, you aren't. We aren't finished talking about this. We are finished, and I need to get away from you. I'm going over to Brian's to discuss this. I'm not calling that a-hole's father. Since he listens to you, you can tell him what his kid must do to avoid jail time. Clock's ticking. Pete, come back here. He ignored her, walked into the garage, placed his bag into his car, and drove away with Joan standing there with her hands on her hips and an exasperated expression on her face. Pete had never done anything like that. While driving to Brian's, Pete also decided that he needed to do some traveling for his business. What he feared was that based on his wife's reaction and hers and Ricky's comments, she had already succumbed to Andrew. Traveling would get him away from her and give him a little time to see exactly how involved she was with Andrew. At this point, he believed that stupid kid. Damn it, Joan. Brian and Pete talked and agreed upon 6 p.m. tomorrow or they would call the police. Pete went to a local hotel and sat at the desk and worked with the Braves game playing in the background. Around 5 p.m., his phone rang. He had blocked Joan's phone and the home phone so he could have some peace. He wondered who it was. Eva. Hey, baby. Hey, daddy. She said, I'm driving back to the apartment. Are you nearby? At Vanderbilt, Eva shared an apartment with Carrie and Lily on campus. All Vanderbilt undergrads are required to live on campus. The three of them, undergraduates, being together in one of those very nice apartments was an unusual arrangement when campus housing requests seem to be decided by random rolls of the dice. Supposedly, there is a very convoluted selection process for getting into one of those coveted apartments. 
He guessed that Brian simply asked how much he needed to donate to the university to make it happen, and it happened. Brian and his wife were born into money, a lot of old school money, and he had also done very well in entertainment law there in Nashville. He came from a long line of Williamson's and had contributed significantly to the Williamson Medical Center in the Williamson County seat of Franklin, Tennessee. Pete answered her, I am. I'm at the residence and near the mall. Room 413. I'll be there in a few minutes. Ten minutes later, he heard a knock on the door. When he opened it, Eva hugged him fiercely. I don't understand, Daddy. Why doesn't Mom believe us? I'd say she doesn't think very highly of my ability to protect my family. Eva said she should. I told her about Paris. Pete shrugged. Let me guess. She didn't believe you. Eva shook her head, and he could see a tear leak from her eye. He said, I'm sorry, baby. Maybe great big Andrew convinced her that I don't quite measure up. I don't know. You don't believe what that a-hole said? Do you? For the second time, what he wanted to say was that he thought the reason that Joan had lost all respect for him as a man was because she was likely screwing someone a lot bigger than he was. He wanted to tell his daughter that it appeared that her mother was a 304, but he didn't say that. He said, no. He was just talking smack. Pete hated lying to his daughter, but he didn't want her thinking those things about her mother. It may turn out that they are true, and while things didn't look good, it was just speculation for the moment. Don't worry, sweetie. Everything is going to be fine. You'll see. She replied, I want to believe you, daddy, but I'm worried. Don't be. We'll be okay. She wondered if he meant her and him, or their family. A few minutes later, she left. School would begin in a couple of weeks, and she had her summer internship at the University Medical Center that had a few more days left. The next day, he checked his home security app on his phone to see when the garage doors opened and closed signaling when Joan had left for work. The good thing about running your own small consulting company was that when you weren't traveling, you could work from your home office. The bad thing about that was when you were having a fight with your wife, you couldn't escape to the office. Finally, at lunchtime, he checked his messages. He had 20 texts from his wife, some of them quite long. Most of them were about his being unreasonable. The last one said, you, when? He'll be there at 6. I left you a voicemail. When he checked his voicemail, he skipped all of them, which he would later delete, but listened to the last one. Pete, Andrew said that Ricky would be there a couple of minutes before 6 tonight to apologize. I'm still not happy with you for putting me in this situation. We can talk about that after everyone leaves. Pete rolled his eyes. It was still somehow his fault. He was supposed to drive up to Louisville, Kentucky to lead an operations planning whiteboarding session for one of his clients all day Thursday and Friday morning. He decided that he would drive there tonight, after the apology, and arrive a couple of days early. He would absorb one hotel night himself and do some pre-work with the client in person on Wednesday. At 5.45 p.m., Brian and Carrie arrived. She gave Pete a big hug, and Brian shook his hand and said, Well, this should be interesting. Are you and Joan okay? It sounded like this is putting you in a bad spot. Nothing to worry about. We will be. She's trying to wrap her head around her little husband beating up great big Ricky. Brian said, I'll admit that I'm a little surprised, too. Not so much that you did it, but how convincingly you did it. I guess I shouldn't have been. You've always seemed very prepared in everything you do. Thanks, Brian. Hopefully, Joan will remember that as well. If you don't mind, we'll wait out here, because I don't want that piece of shit in my house. I wouldn't either. A couple of minutes before 6 p.m., a red, two-door BMW pulled into their driveway. When Ricky got out, he was not wearing a happy face. Joan still hadn't arrived. He approached the three of them standing there and said, Carrie, I'm sorry about Saturday. I was out of line. I miss you and wanted us to go out again. I took your rejection poorly. I know we won't be going out anymore, but I hope I haven't destroyed our friendship. I'm sorry. He seemed somewhat contrite, but cynically Pete thought he was probably just looking for a way to get into her pants one day. Carrie said, I don't know if we'll ever be friends again, Ricky, but I'll try to be polite and at least friendly. That's the best I can do right now. I understand. Ricky turned to Brian, Mr. Williamson. I'm sorry about what I did to Carrie and her SUV. Just send us the bill and we'll take care of it. The words, I'm sorry, may have come out of his mouth, but he didn't seem very sorry. Brian just nodded. When Ricky looked at Pete, the contriteness was gone. Mr. Clark, I apologize for interrupting the party and barging onto your property. I shouldn't have done that. Okay, Ricky. Thank you. I think we're done here. Before Ricky turned to walk back to his car, he had a smirk on his face that they all could see. 
When he reached the car door, he looked at Pete and mouthed the word Kitty. Pete opened his hand and pointed to it like he did Saturday, meaning he'd believe him when he saw the evidence. Ricky grinned and got in his car. Brian said, well, his apology to Carrie seemed sincere, but ours? Not so much. What did he say to you before he drove off? Pete shook his head. Nothing important. We had a discussion as he was leaving the other day. He was bringing it up to try and provoke me, again. Carrie wanted to say something, but she felt terrible that she had ever agreed to go out with him in the first place. Talk about a poor decision. Brian said, well, if you need any help with him, just let me know. I can have a team of lawyers on him and his father with one phone call. I might even find a deputy or two that could shadow him for a couple of weekends. That could prove entertaining. He smiled at the thought. Thanks, Brian. Let's hold off on that for now. I've got a few other problems I need to resolve first. Brian nodded. After dropping Eva at home yesterday, Carrie told her parents all the nasty things that Ricky had said about Joan. They had known Joan for years. None of them thought he was telling the truth. At least, they hoped so. Brian and Pete shook hands. Carrie gave him a goodbye hug, and they drove away. Pete opened the garage and drove off after they left. As he was pulling out of his driveway, Joan's car was approaching. Pete didn't even bother to wave as he pointed his car north towards Louisville. He would use the time to figure out what he was going to do regarding getting some evidence, one way or another. What he needed most of all was to get away. He was still furious with his wife for the disrespect, and with Ricky's accusations on top, he knew he wouldn't be able to keep from saying something he might regret. He would use the time away to calm himself and prepare. Ten minutes later his phone was ringing. He considered not answering but decided there wasn't much left to lose except the aggravation. Maybe he could placate her enough that she would leave him alone while he was gone. Hello, Joan. Pete, I hope you are only going to the store and coming right back. No. My client needed me to come to Louisville a couple of days early. I'll be there until after I have lunch with him on Friday. I should be home in time to eat dinner with you after that. Then he decided to get in a little dig. Well, that assumes you won't be traveling with Andrew this weekend. She was surprised by the comment. What? No. You know I only travel every six to eight weeks. Why would you say that? It's nothing. Had you been there on Saturday, you would have seen the whole thing. I'm still a little upset over your taking Ricky's side. I know you are, and I'm sorry. Andrew isn't very happy either, but that is understood. Did Ricky show up and apologize? Pete said, he gave what seemed like a sincere apology to Carrie, but I suspect that was because he'd still want to try to have sex with her someday. He told Brian and me he was sorry, but that was the most disingenuous apology I've ever received. You and Andrew should be happy that he's not going to jail. He's just a kid, Pete. He's a 20-year-old young man that needs to get his anger under control and learn to respect others. Joan let out an audible sigh. I want to talk to you about all of this tonight. Can we talk when you get home on Friday? Sure. I'll miss you, Pete. Pete thought that she wouldn't. Have a good week, Joan. Then he hung up the phone. Joan was surprised at how he ended their conversation. This whole thing was upsetting her sweet husband. While she still thought he wasn't very understanding regarding how the whole situation impacted her work, she knew this would just be a bump in their long road together. On Friday, she'd prepare him something nice to eat and plan to give him a nice night in the bedroom as well. Then this would all blow over. It was just over three hours to Louisville, plenty of time to think about what he needed to do. He was pretty sure that the brat, Ricky, knew too much for it to just be idle gossip. It didn't say very much about his father that he would share that kind of info with his son. But if Andrew was the kind of man that slept with married women, the fact that he isn't the greatest father wouldn't come as too much of surprise, either. The only thing he truly suspected was that Joan and Andrew screwed while away on trips. Of course, they could be having sex in town, as Ricky said. Andrew was divorced, so they wouldn't even need hotels. Damn. However, he suspected that Ricky would be looking for proof to rub Pete's nose in it. He could try to fabricate something, but Pete would be on the lookout for that. What Pete planned to do was to travel as much as he could for the next several weeks. If she was a cheater and he was out of town, then the two of them might get careless and do it at their house. Andrew seemed like just enough of an a-hole to want to try that, and Joan seemed beholden enough to Andrew that she might allow it. Or maybe Pete should just hire a PI and have them followed. Sigh. He couldn't believe it had come to this, but Joan's disrespect of him was unexpected. How wondered how long he had been blinded by his love for his wife. As soon as he checked into his hotel, he went to Amazon, opened a new account, and ordered several different hidden Wi-Fi cameras and planned to place them in his house. 
they would be delivered on Thursday to his hotel. Hopefully, they would never record anything, but he wasn't liking the odds on that. It was a long week for everyone. Eva called her dad a couple of times, and he told her he was fine. Donnie even called once to check on him, and Pete told him the same thing. Everything was okay. Joan left text and voice messages telling him that she loved him and missed him. They were conveniently left during the times when Pete was with his clients. He was glad of that because he didn't want to talk to Joan. On Friday, he made the three-and-a-half-hour drive home, dreading what might be waiting for him, but it went better than expected. When he arrived, Joan was dressed nicely in a flattering dress that hit just above her knees. She was wearing high heels and nice jewelry, which Pete suspected meant that she wanted to go out to eat. In her heels, she was as tall as him, which never bothered him at all. He always loved having her on his arm. That night, he was fine with their going out because it would keep her in a good mood and likely prevent any conversation from wandering towards anything serious until they got home. He changed quickly, and she asked him to drive them to a swanky steakhouse that she knew he liked. Like the evenings where they would go to performances, she was on his arm all night. She eased off one of her shoes and rubbed his leg under the table. He hated that she could have this effect on him when he was still aggravated. He wondered how many more nights there would be like this, praying that he was wrong but fearing that what he suspected was true. Once at home, as soon as they walked through the door, she was all over him. They didn't make it past the family room before she had removed her dress and thong and was working on his zipper. Standing there in her garters and heels had the desired effect on Pete, and Joan didn't mind one bit when he pulled her up, spun her around and screwed her while she was bent over the couch. She pulled him up the stairs towards the bedroom and did it again. That was wonderful. I needed that. I love you, Pete. He hugged his wife and replied. I loved you too, Joan. She missed the verb tense. After she had lain on him for a few more minutes, she went to the restroom to prepare for bed. Upon returning to the bedroom, she spooned back into her husband, pulled his arm around herself and blissfully went to sleep, believing all was right with the world. The following morning found Joan already awake and drawing circles on her husband's chest. Once she could tell he was good and awake, she said, Thank you for last night. It was a good night. He had to admit it was rather nice. My pleasure, sweetie. The word sweetie caused him to remember what Ricky had said. Joan said, I do need to tell you something, but I hope you won't get too upset. I need to go to Memphis to meet with one of our university clients on Thursday. They want a complete review of their portfolio. I should be back on Friday. Oh, how did this happen? Don't these get scheduled a little further out in advance? She replied, normally they do, but a competitor has been talking to them, and they are one of my top clients, so Andrew wants me to go talk some sense into them. Oh, so, you were going alone this time? I am. They've been with me a long time, so it should be okay. He was quietly thinking for a minute. She asked him, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm in a similar situation. I have to travel next weekend and all the following week. General Dynamics VP of Supply Chain over their Gulfstream division wants me to attend a supply chain IT conference with him in Orlando. Then I'll be with them at their Savannah factory the rest of the week. She sat up at that revelation, causing herself to become uncovered which looked amazing as her jugs were still jiggling once she was sitting. Not caring much about anything else anymore, Pete reacted by pulling her to him so he could begin to kiss. Pete had always loved her figure because she still was and always had been very curvy, with full jugs and bum to match. Joan wanted to know more about what was an unusual trip for him. Slow, morning sex followed by a good shower had been rare for them over the last several years, and they both enjoyed it immensely. She hated that they didn't do it more often, but she knew that was partially her fault. Pete hated feeling like it was all about to come to a painful end. Sitting over breakfast, she didn't want to ask, but she did anyway. Pete, we didn't talk about last weekend. Are we okay? I hope you know how much I love you. We need to find a way past this because I have long-term plans for you and for us. He smiled at her and squeezed her hand. I'd like that too, Joan. Though he didn't think it was going to happen. He had to give her credit. She tried all weekend and early the following week to love him, not only with sex, as much as she had in many, many years. He did his best to reciprocate, but he honestly felt like the end was quickly coming. Over the weekend, he installed a small GPS tracker on her car to map out where she went. He took all the Amazon shipments that had been hiding in the trunk of his car and put them into place. He replaced smoke detectors, books on bookshelves, and wall receptacles with devices containing hidden Wi-Fi cameras and microphones. He added a couple of outdoor cameras to his security system. His house was now completely covered for video and sound, 
and rather than feeling prepared, he felt terrible. On Thursday morning, Joan kissed him goodbye, and he asked, Will you drive your car to Memphis or grab a rental? I'll take mine. Don't worry, the company will reimburse the mileage, and I'll be safe for driving my car. Okay, be careful. I will, baby. Love you. Love you too. It didn't take long to get confirmation of what he feared. A few hours later, when she should have been either at their Brentwood office or on I-40 driving to Memphis, the GPS on her car was showing at Andrew's house. His marriage was officially over. Pete needed to burn off some steam, so he went to his dojo to spar with whoever was there, and then work out. He wanted to stay sharp, because if he ever got the chance, he'd make Andrew pay physically. So much for self-defense, only. Thanks again, Joan. Joan did him the courtesy of texting him later in the day, saying she had made it safely to Memphis. The GPS still showed her car at Andrew's house. He prepared for his fake trip to Orlando and decided he would call tomorrow to find a P.I. to tail his wife. He didn't need to bother. Early Friday morning, an email was delivered to his business email address with the subject, for the kitty bear. In the message it said, I found your email on your website. I've been working on my dad, and he told me that before long, I'll be screwing her, too. Included was a link to a cloud account that included hours and hours of video from several cameras in Andrew's home. It seemed to be recently set up and was recording the events live as they happened. He watched the first recorded stream and saw Joan and Andrew walking into the house. Andrew began undressing her in the family room, and like Pete the previous Friday night, Andrew had Joan bent over his couch screwing her. Pete had seen enough. He drove up to the airport, parked his car in long-term parking, and called his wife and was sent to voicemail, as expected. He left a message saying, I'm at the airport and leaving now. I'll text you while I'm gone. With the background noise from the airport, it would sound like he was flying out soon. He didn't fly anywhere. He went to the airport Marriott to hang out and watch some of the evidence he now had on his wife. Stupid kid. Pete didn't really need, nor want, to see them having sex. That one time over the back of the couch was enough. Actually, simply seeing her car at Andrew's house overnight was enough. He was curious regarding what they would say, though. It was soul-crushing. Even not watching the video, he had to suffer through the moaning and groaning and slapping and slurping, but eventually he heard several key pieces of information. First, Andrew, I know today and tomorrow are because you're pissed, but it's not like you have to try and reclaim me. I know that. Why would I need to reclaim what is already mine? I'm still pissed off about Ricky having to apologize. You need to learn how to better control your little husband. I've been withholding myself from him like you asked me to. She lied. He thundered. Ask. I don't ask you to do anything. You do what I tell you to do if you want all the benefits that come with me. She was getting tired of this overbearing and owning behavior. She was fairly certain that Andrew was close to his expiration date if she wanted to keep her marriage intact, which she did. I know that. I like being with you, but I love Pete. He's a good father and a good husband. I'm not giving him up either. He and I are going to ride off into the sunset together. If you love him so much, why are you screwing me? She smiled at him. You know why. You miss being with a big man. I know. It's okay, baby. No. It's not your big tool, though I'm not complaining. He is a fine lover, it's just that I don't know. Sometimes I like being with someone who I can still look up to when I'm wearing my heels. I like wearing a man's t-shirt that hangs below my butt. I like putting my hand on your biceps and feeling something large, not just lean. When you and I walk down a street, I never have to worry about someone coming up and picking a fight with you. After working with you all these years, I was reminded that I miss that from time to time. Don't worry, my sweet. You keep taking care of me, and I'll keep taking care of you. Although if you can't keep him in line, I may have to have a conversation with him. I'm still pissed at him for sucker punching Ricky. She said, you will not. If you attempt to harm so much as a hair on his head, you'll regret it. You will not hurt my husband. Do you hear me? This surprised Andrew and Pete. Andrew said, fine, fine. If he means that much to you, I won't hurt the little man, but don't you forget who you belong to. That statement irritated her, because she didn't belong to anyone, but if she did, it was to her husband. Also, get him under control. I don't want him sneaking up on me and hitting me in the back. That wouldn't end well for him. She said, I told you that the girls told me he didn't do that. I don't know how, but he supposedly beat him fair and square. Andrew laughed. I'm sure they just corroborated their stories. No way could that little kitty beat Ricky. No way. He's not a kitty, but if he is, he's my kitty bear. You let me handle him. Andrew laughed. As long as I get to handle you, I'll live with that for now. 
She wondered what he meant by for now. She didn't have to wait long. The second interesting exchange was after he left the message from the airport. Based on Andrew's attitude, Pete expected what came after. Jones said, well, he's gone for a week. Andrew's smile was not pretty when he said, outstanding. Now we can take a few more days off and screw some more. Joan replied, yes, well, not if you keep screwing me so hard. You are going to bruise me. How am I going to explain that to him? Well, you aren't supposed to be screwing him very often, if at all, so how's he going to see it? He still sees me getting dressed. You told me you like for me to tease him. Andrew did smile at that thought. Well, if we get to have sex for the next week, you would better keep him away for a few days or he will feel how stretched out you are. She replied, a cool bath in 24 hours usually is enough for me to tighten back up. Besides, he isn't that much smaller than you. Andrew didn't want to hear that. Taking command, he said, here's what we'll do. I'll be gentle like you want me to be, but not here. In my house or while we travel, I'll screw you the way I want. If we are in your house, I'll be sweet, like your cute little husband. You said he wouldn't be back until next Friday night. This worried Joan. She and Andrew had never had sex in her house before. I'm not so sure that's a good idea. Remember what I said yesterday. You do what I say, and everything will work out fine. If it worries you that much, I won't sleep at your home. We'll just have a few long lunches there. That will seem perfectly innocent. Joan hesitated a few minutes, but with Pete in Orlando, and then Savannah, she should be okay. She would just call him for a few minutes each morning, and each night to check up on him. Okay. Only long lunches. This just reconfirmed to her that she needed to get away from Andrew. And soon. But how? Andrew's evil smile reappeared because he was thinking that once he was inside the house, she would have a hard time getting him out. Andrew wasn't very worried about Pete showing up early. He could handle angry husbands, especially one the size of Pete. Pete made copies of all the videos that were in the cloud folder. Once they left Andrew's house, he would delete the server files, which meant that unless Ricky was saving them elsewhere, Pete should have the only copies. Pete had several calls he needed to make. Being a Friday afternoon, he hoped people were still working. His first call was to Brian. Hey, Brian. It's Pete. Got a sec. Sure, buddy. I have a few. What's up? Remember the conversation we were having at my house when Ricky showed up to apologize? I do. Pete said, it seems that what Ricky was bragging about is true. Joan has been having an affair. I don't know how long it has been going on, but I know it's been a while. Oh, man. I'm so sorry. I take it this isn't a social call. I'm afraid not. I need a favor. I need a very good divorce lawyer, quickly. Brain replied, done. I know just the woman. She can be mean and vicious, or just get it over with. Whichever you prefer. Let me give her your info, and she'll make time for you today. That sounds good. Also, please tell Miriam not to mention this to anyone. I know you don't keep secrets from her, so I need this kept quiet until I give Joan the papers. Probably next week. Sure. Pete, I'm sorry for both of you. We've always liked you and Joan. Pete said, thanks, Brian. I'm sorry, too. I owe you. No, you don't. We've been friends for a long time, and our daughters have been for even longer. This is just me helping a friend. When this is all said and done, you can buy me a beer or two if you want. I think I might enjoy that. Consider it done. Brian put feared family lawyer Charla Steele in touch with Pete, and she began to prepare divorce papers. That evening, he could see Joan's car had returned to their home. Just before Pete was planning on going to sleep, his phone rang. It was Joan. Hey, Pete. How's Orlando? Hot and humid, with a chance of rain, which is pretty normal for late August. How's Memphis? She replied, you mean Nashville. I got back this afternoon. It's lonely without you. I wish we could have another Friday night like last Friday night. Yeah, I'd like that too. Pete would love to go back to a month or so ago when he thought his wife was faithful and have a night like last Friday. But there was no going back. They talked a few more minutes, and she professed her love for him. Love you, Pete. Love you, too, Joan. When he disconnected the call, he was terribly sad, but the more he thought about it, the angrier he became. The next day, Saturday, he went back to the airport and rented a car. He needed to get to a dojo and practice some. He couldn't use his car or go to his normal one for fear that someone there might know his wife or daughter and spill the beans on his being in town. He made a few calls and found one near the Opry, away from their home and her work, that would let him come. He spent Saturday and Sunday sparring and working in their gym. They were good workouts and he felt pretty good about his current level of ability. He would text Joan and she would text back. 
He could see her car at their home, and the cameras showed that she was there alone on Saturday, but apparently Eva visited her on Sunday. That made him sad. He was about to lose his family. He didn't anticipate losing the kids, but with the upcoming divorce, their family unit would be no more. After a few minutes, his sadness changed to determination. He thought, oh, well, I guess you have to deal with what life gives you, which is what he was planning to do. On Monday morning, Pete received an unexpected phone call from Brian. Pete, I needed to give you a quick call. Joan called Miriam last night. She asked her if we would float her resume to our investment advisors because she felt it was time for a change. Miriam said she would look into it. What do you think? I realize this doesn't excuse the affair, but maybe she is trying to get away from the a-hole. Pete thought a minute. He thought about his family, what he planned to do, and how his life was likely to play out. While she would never be his wife again, it would probably cause fewer problems with the children if she could get away from Andrew. Yeah, go ahead. The damage has already been done, but I think that might make life easier on everyone. Brian replied, I understand. By Monday afternoon, Charla had the divorce papers prepared and Pete wondered if the liaison at his house would happen soon. Joan called him that night saying she missed him and loved him. He tried to return the affection. Donnie called him, too, and they had a good chat. He suspected that Eva had some idea of what was going on, regardless of his protestations. But Donnie? Unless Eva told him, and she probably had, he was going to be blindsided by all of this. Damn you, Joan, he thought. Pete didn't sleep well that night. Pete worked from the hotel on Tuesday morning and around lunchtime was alerted by the GPS on Joan's car leaving her office going towards their home. They could ride together, but that might seem risky, so he suspected they would take their respective cars. His home security cameras alerted him to two cars pulling into his driveway. He made preparations to drive home. He wasn't in any hurry. He expected them to take several hours. Around 2 p.m., Joan said, we should be getting back. People will begin to look for us. Andrew replied, don't worry about it. I own the company. Nobody will question me. True, they won't question you, but they might wonder about me. I don't want anyone telling my husband. Why? You don't think he would divorce you, do you? Yet another confirmation that Andrew had no real interest in her beyond sex. I don't know. I know he wouldn't want to. He might get by a one-time mistake, but if he knew how long, I don't think he would forgive me. Andrew said, you've kept him in the dark for three years. I think you can manage. Yes, well maybe I can, if we only see each other once a month or so like we used to. The last few weeks have been dangerous. I'd like to keep it so that nobody but us knows, which is why at least I should get back to the office. Andrew smiled thinking about Ricky knowing and maybe participating sometime soon. Joan was a good employee, but not irreplaceable. Her future with the firm could be tied to how she behaves going forward. He thought he had her in a good place. She couldn't make waves at the office because it would eventually get back to her husband. The same thing went for her potentially accusing him of sexual harassment. Even if she tried that, accusations were one thing, but proving it when the affair had been going on so long would be extremely difficult. So he felt like he had the power and control over the situation. Pete had parked down the street, out of sight of the house. He had been there for an hour listening to their screwing and conversation from the Wi-Fi cameras that were streaming all movement and noise to the cloud. He heard the comment about three years and thought himself a fool. Rather than getting down, he used that to fuel his fire. He checked his home security system on his phone app to make sure no alarms were set and that there would be no chimes when he opened the back door. He snuck in and quietly climbed the stairs. Once at the landing, he heard Joan pleading, Come on, Andrew. I need to get back to the office. Pete stepped into their bedroom and said, That means get the hell out. Joan was stunned to see her husband standing there. She pulled the sheet to cover herself and exclaimed, Pete, I thought you were in Savannah. This, this isn't what it looks like. Pete leaned against the doorframe and replied, Now Joan, normally you are a fairly intelligent woman, but that has to be the stupidest thing to ever come out of your mouth. Well, except for that dipshit. He could see his wife's face and neck flame red at that comment. Good, he said. At least you have some shame. Andrew said, well, well. The little decided to come and see how a full-sized man takes care of your wife. Don't worry. She says she only loves you, but we both know that she loves having sex with me. Shut up, Andrew. That's not true, Pete. She sobbed out, I only love you. Pete replied, apparently not enough to stay away from this lard bum. To Andrew he said, well, I seem to recall it was your stupid baby boy on the ground the other day struggling to get up when I beat him with my bare hands. 
Maybe I should go give him another lesson for your screwing this 304? Or would you care to take your best shot at me? Though deserved, that comment hurt Joan. Pete had never said an old thing about her. The other statement surely got Andrew's attention. I'm going to beat you to death in your own house, in front of your little wife. She wanted a bigger and better man than you, and she got one. Yeah, yeah, get your shorts or pants on and meet me in the backyard. I don't want your bum naked after I call the ambulance to come and collect you. As Andrew stood to retrieve his pants, Pete started laughing at Andrew, pointing at his tool. Joan, you traded me in for that baby carrot? Good God. You can say that you wanted a taller man, but you definitely weren't interested in his being bigger. Actually, Andrew was a little bigger, as Joan described, but no man is ever in a good mood when someone laughs at his tool, and Pete wanted Andrew angry. Pete left the room, not waiting for either of them. Joan was crying even harder now. Seeing Andrew advance after husband got her moving, though. She had to put a stop to this. She didn't want her husband hurt. She lunged for Andrew, but only managed to scratch the top of his shoulders and back with her fingernails. Surprised by her actions, Andrew, instinctively, turned and backhanded her, hard, which knocked her back against the headboard of the bed, hurting and stunning her to the point of near unconsciousness. Pete was already moving quickly down the stairs and, lucky for Andrew, didn't hear Joan being hit. He didn't want his home destroyed during the upcoming altercation, because Pete had no intention of this ending quickly, nor did he have any intention of vacating his home. Pete inserted a mouthpiece, just in case. Then he sprinted into his backyard as if he were being chased, in full sight of his new security camera facing his backyard. Andrew wasn't far behind him. Andrew said, I'm going to enjoy beating on you, Pete. After I'm done, I'm going to bring Joan here and screw her on one of the chairs by the pool so you can watch. Speaking around the mouthpiece, Pete said, I don't care if you screw her or not. She doesn't matter to me anymore. What I'm doing here is teaching you not to screw married women. I expect it to be a painful lesson for you. In the backyard, Andrew smirked and walked up to Pete, hoping to simply grab him and beat the crap out of him. He thought that his superior reach should be a big help in the fight. As expected, Andrew at least showed a little more experience than Ricky and had his hands up in a typical boxing position. With his shirt off, Pete could see that Andrew had huge arms and shoulders to match his frame. Clearly, he spent some time in the gym, but the flab around his midsection suggested that he spent most of his time on the weights and had very little cardio. Well, except for screwing Joan. That would give the advantage to Pete in a longer fight and also suggested that his midsection could be soft. As long as Pete could avoid those big meaty fists from getting too close, he should be okay. For the security system's recording, Pete had his hands up as if he didn't want to fight. When he hurt Andrew, he wanted to make sure it looked like it was self-defense. He only planned to release the video if Andrew tried to make up a story or file charges. Hopefully, nobody would ever see the video. Andrew rushed at Pete, throwing several jabs and trying to grab him. Pete easily stepped backwards avoiding them. Andrew paused for a moment, and with Pete's hands up, Andrew appeared to again be the aggressor. Pete was just waiting for his moment. Andrew would rush throwing punches, and Pete would move out of the way or parry the punches with his arms. From the camera, Pete still looked as if he was trying to stay away from this much larger attacker. As long as he was careful, Pete could do this all day, but he could already see Andrew breathing hard. After a few minutes of this dance, Andrew's big right-handed haymaker came, as expected. It looked just like Ricky's, though from a stronger opponent. Just like he did against Ricky, he hit Andrew hard in his right kidney. While Andrew did bend over in pain, he didn't go down. That was no problem for Pete. Since Andrew wasn't recovering quickly, Pete jumped up and when he descended, delivered a vicious elbow down into the kidney area with a loud thunk. Pete was hoping that the twelfth rib was fully floating now after that strike. Andrew did go down this time onto his hands and knees. He wasn't trying hard to get up because he couldn't. His side was on fire. How did that little shit hit him so hard? Pete stood, waiting for Andrew to stand. With this being recorded, he needed Andrew to continue to look like the aggressor, though that was becoming harder to do. Eventually, Andrew stood and put his hands up like he planned to box again, but Pete could tell that he wasn't moving well. Now, Pete was enjoying Andrew throwing punches. With his rib hurting, the jabs weren't very hard. They almost looked more for show. He knew each punch thrown had to be excruciating, especially for someone not used to being hit or in pain. With Andrew moving more slowly, Pete could now return jabs, but each jab was purposefully to the side that was hit earlier, or to the kidney area on the opposite side. With each blow, the grimaces turned to anguish on Andrew's face. 
Andrew realized he wasn't going to win this fight. He hoped he could get close enough to the smaller man to rush him and grab him and take him down to the ground because he realized he simply wasn't fast enough to hit the speedy guy. Also, his side was killing him, and he was starting to have a hard time breathing. Back in the bedroom, after regaining her wits, Joan threw on a robe to hurry down the stairs. On the way out of the bedroom, she grabbed her phone, calling 911 saying that her husband and her boss were fighting in her backyard and to send an ambulance. She froze as she went by her husband's home office and quickly ran inside. The next time Andrew tried to rush Pete, it was more of a lumbering, and he was off balance from the pain. Pete tripped him up, and when Andrew landed on his hands and knees, Pete pretended he was the kicker for the Titans. He wound up and got in the crushing groin shot he had wanted. Andrew's reaction was to cry out and curl into a fetal position with his hands trying to protect his balls. Too late. Andrew wouldn't be getting up without help nor was it likely he would be getting it up any time soon. Pity, Pete said to a moaning Andrew, who's the bear, now, a hole? I'm a screwing Kodiak compared to you. You're lucky I don't drag your bum into the pool and drown you. Pete sat on the ground about ten feet away listening to Andrew whimper and moan in pain. Normally, he would have hated to see anyone hurting that badly. He felt nothing for this man, except maybe that a little justice had just been served. He was waiting for either the police or ambulance to arrive, hoping that Joan had called them. He was surprised that he hadn't seen her. Where was she? What happened next stunned Pete. Joan was running out of the house with the shotgun in her hands and a black eye beginning to show. She was going towards Andrew, pointing the gun, necessitating Pete to jump up and calm the distraught woman. She was yelling, You will not hurt my husband. I'll kill you. Do you hear me? You will not hurt my husband. Not much chance of that happening. Pete hugged her to him, causing the gun to point down towards the ground and he gently eased the gun out of her hands and set it on the ground away from them. Several minutes later, when the police officer arrived and approached them, she was still repeating, You will not hurt my husband. You will not hurt my husband. It seemed she was coming undone. The officer removed the shells from the shotgun and then checked on the injured man. Speaking to dispatch, he heard the ambulance was only a few minutes away. By now, Andrew was coughing up blood, which surprised the officer because the only visible marks on him were on his sides which were red, and it looked like some early bruising was setting in and some deep scratches on his upper back. He saw the forming black eye on Joan and spoke to her first. Ma'am, are you okay? That stopped her murmuring and seemed to rouse her. She replied, he, he. Then she sobbed for a moment and pointed towards Andrew. He assaulted me. When my husband showed up, Andrew chased him. Pete was bewildered by the response. Assault? It was purely consensual. The officer asked, Ma'am, you need to get to the hospital so the abuse can be documented. Okay. Can my husband take me? Sure. But you need to go as soon as possible. Right now would be better. I'll stay here by the attacker until the ambulance arrives, replied the officer. He looked Pete up and down and said, You look unscathed. Let me guess. You're a black belt or something. Pete shook his head and said, Or something. I know how to protect myself and my family, but I can promise you that I'm much more damaged than you can possibly imagine. The officer nodded, and Joan wept on her husband's shoulder knowing that it wasn't Andrew that had hurt her husband. She was the one that had damaged him. Pete took Joan inside to put on some clothes to go to the hospital. She asked him if he would come with her to help her change, but he shook his head, no. He didn't want to go with her upstairs, because he didn't want to see the bedroom where she had been with her lover. Joan looked like she had aged 10 years as she descended the steps. The ambulance had arrived, and as they walked past the officer, Pete asked, Can we have his car towed away? I don't want it here when we return. Joan doesn't need to see it. Not that he was that concerned about Joan. He just wanted it gone. The officer said he would take care of it. In the car, they drove in silence until almost halfway to the hospital. Joan said, Speak to me, Pete. Yell at me. Scream at me. Call me a 304. Again but tell me what you were thinking. Pete continued to drive. After another minute, he said, Assault? How are you going for assault? Everyone will know it was consensual. I won't lie for you. Joan's face fell. I would like to use this as a chance to keep him away from me. He was becoming too controlling, and I had planned to leave him and his firm anyway. So, I've heard. She looked at her husband with surprise. Just because I'm short in height doesn't mean I'm short in intellect. She whispered, I know. He said, I would ask you why you did it, but I already know. I'm sorry, she whispered. The sad thing is I would do almost anything for you. You know I would, but one of the few things I cannot change is the thing you held against me all these years. 
You should have never married me, Joan. Please don't say that. I made a horrible mistake. We've been so good together. We have a great family, a great house, and good jobs. We have a really good life. Well, except for your long-buried addiction for taller, larger men. That was a direct hit. He continued, Besides, you should have thought of all of those wonderful things and decided an affair wasn't worth the risk. As a portfolio manager, you should know all about risk. I know. I was so stupid. Can you please forgive me? Pete shook his head. Maybe one day, but not any time soon. She asked, So does that mean there is a chance we will stay together? No. That isn't going to happen. But, but, why? He scoffed. Why do you think? She replied, Because of the affair? We can go to counseling. We can overcome this. Joan, this wasn't just an affair. His little shit of a son sent me a link on Friday to a cloud account where the sex fest you and Andrew had Thursday and Friday was recorded. She gasped at that revelation. I don't know if Andrew set it up or Ricky. Either way, I heard you. You won't have to worry about wearing high heels around me any longer. It never bothered me before. I wish I knew that it always bothered you. No longer will you have to worry about people thinking your short husband is an easy target to attack. Do you still think Eva made up the story about Paris? Joan shaking her head, no, was almost imperceptible, but it was very clear. Oh, also, just so you know. When Ricky emailed me the link in his message, he said that Andrew had agreed to find a way to let him screw you, too. No wonder he came into our backyard as if he owned it. He had no respect for me, nor for us. Why should he, when his father didn't either? And who disrespected our marriage first? That would be you, Joan. She was devastated at the realization that she had disrespected Pete first. Also, she was appalled at the idea of Ricky thinking he could have sex with her. She didn't like Ricky. Now she knew why he had been hanging around so much. She couldn't believe she had fallen so far. Pete, I, I, I don't know what to say, except to keep saying that I'm sorry. You may be, but sorry isn't enough. You lost faith in me. You lost respect for me. Even though I'm a better man than him in every way, that just wasn't enough for you. Was it? Joan looked out the window as the tears streamed down her face. She asked, what now? I had planned to give you divorce papers today. I'll hold off a little while on those depending on how the next few days go. We are still getting divorced, but giving you the papers on the day you were supposedly assaulted probably wouldn't look good in family court. He asked, so how do you plan to pull off assault? And what was with the shotgun? Do you plan to send an innocent man to jail? I wanted to send him to the morgue, but you were just as guilty as he is, so. That comment made her want to leap from the moving car. Joan said, there is nothing innocent about him. All you have to say to the police is that I was crying when you got to the bedroom. You didn't see anything else. Once Andrew saw you, he came after you. I'll take care of the rest. That way you don't have to lie. That is a lie, he said. I know, but I was pleading for him to leave. The tears would have been coming soon thereafter. I have this black eye to prove he hit me and skin from his back under my fingernails to show that I tried to fight him off. Pete said, and don't forget your inner part full of his come to show that he screwed you. Oops. I mean assaulted you. Joan lost it at that comment and started sobbing. Pete asked, you still haven't told me why you got the shotgun. Pulling herself together, she said, crazy things can happen in fights. I wasn't going to let him hurt you. I didn't know how long I had been out of it, so I grabbed it not knowing what the scene would be like when I came outside. Well, was it what you expected to see? They both knew the answer to that question. Pete did appreciate her desire to protect him from harm, but she should have felt that way three years ago and not started an affair. A few minutes later, while still in the car, Pete called Brian. Brian, it's Pete. Joan and I are on the way to the hospital. We are both okay, but we need a good attorney and we need him or her fast. I'll give you the details as soon as I can probably later today. Oh, man. Sorry to hear that. I'll make a few calls. Are you going to Williamson's Medical Center? We are. Brian said, okay. Good. I'm glad you're keeping it in the family. Sorry, that was my poor attempt to lighten the situation. I'll make sure that someone will meet you shortly. Don't talk to anyone until you talk to your attorney. Pete replied, we understand, and thanks, Brian. Pete disconnected the call and looked at his soon-to-be ex-wife. You understood that, right? This is a dangerous game you are playing, and you need to get your story straight before you tie yourself up in lies and end up in jail yourself. On top of the adultery, I'm sure your children and family would love to have to go visit you in jail. Internally, Joan groaned at her predicament. Maybe she should leap from the car after all.
As Brian mentioned, they were met in the emergency room by the hospital administrator and senior legal counsel. They knew Brian personally and the attorney was distantly related. They were mainly there to ensure that they were seen immediately and that no one tried to question them until they had met with the attorney that Brian was sending. When the attorney showed up, she quickly got to what Joan was trying to achieve. They slowly documented what led up to today, including the length of the affair, some of the details, Ricky showing up and getting involved, the videos from Andrew's place, and the videos from the Clark security system. Joan was humiliated having to detail everything in front of her husband. Pete was past being angry. He was simply numb. Who was this person he had been living with? Ultimately, the attorney advised Joan to seek an out-of-court settlement that would see her compensated long enough to get on with another firm. She didn't think the DA's office would seek to prosecute a criminal case because of the length of the affair, which made today seem like sour grapes, perhaps unfortunate, but that was what was most likely to occur. Also, Andrew's side of the story would set up a case and would be hard to get 12 people to convict him. So why would the DA waste the court's time which would likely only end in a hung jury? However, Andrew would probably want his name and firm kept out of civil court, and more importantly, the headlines. Also, he would probably prefer no mention of the beating he took while at the house of a married woman from her husband. At this point, Pete asked for a couple of minutes with Joan. He said, I don't care if the settlement is for 10000 or $10 million. In the divorce papers, I plan to ask for the house, a 50 50th split of all other assets, excluding my consulting business and no alimony. So, you may want to try and get as much as you can. Wait, I want to amend that. You can have the bed. After today, that filthy thing is yours to do with as you wish. That comment told her that she would truly be alone in pursuing the matter. She was certain that her husband was going to leave her. She knew it was her fault, but facing this by herself was almost overwhelming. She said, you would be willing to fight me for the house? He replied, after everything I've learned over the last few weeks, after what I've seen on video the last few days, after what I saw in our bedroom today, and after what I did to your lover a short while ago, you would ask me what I'm willing to do? You may want to think about what I could do, should I be so determined. Imagine what I could do with those videos and who I could send them to. Your laptop backups are on our home server. So I have the contact information for all of your clients and many of the firm's others and could send them some nice video of their investment advisor not taking vows seriously, nor showing good judgment. How many of them do you think would want to keep working with you? Go ask your lover how angry I am and what I'm willing to do. Trust me, he got off easy. If the only extra thing I take from the marriage you destroyed is our house, then you will have gotten off easy, too. Every time he said the word, lover, it was like a red-hot poker placed against her flesh. It wounded her, but what could she say? She couldn't deny it. There were no extenuating circumstances. Not willing to fight Pete over the absolute mess that she made, she agreed with him and decided she would get whatever she could from the prick that helped her screw up her marriage. Ultimately, after Andrew's surgeries, Joan got a payout from him. It took several weeks to negotiate and a couple more to get the check, but it was enough that if it took her a couple of years to find work and get back to what she was making, she would survive. Not long after that, she did land a new job with the investment advisors that Brian and Miriam used. It didn't pay quite as well as her old one, but it was with a large multinational firm, so she at least had prospects. She found a condo near her new job and set up house, three bedrooms so the kids could come and stay some, hopefully. She gave away the old bedroom set. She didn't want it either. She did her best to put her mistakes behind her, but the nights were the worst. She vacillated between feeling numbness and heart-wrenching despair. Several times she called Pete and cried before hanging up. She didn't actually say anything. She would probably need to see a shrink and hopefully receive a lot of sympathy or hugs from the kids and a few of her siblings that lived nearby. One of the things that helped her with her new company was that she poached some of her old clients from Andrew, which was pretty easy because they liked her and were ready to leave Andrew's firm because someone tipped a reporter to seek and FOIA. Freedom of Information Act Request looking into a police report involving Andrew at the house of a married woman. It seems the officer wrote a rather detailed description of the incident including the attacked but avenged husband, the abused victim, claiming assault and brandishing a shotgun to ensure that her husband was not hurt. The sensational story started in the papers and eventually made it onto the local evening news. Once out of the hospital, Andrew's only answer to questions was, it is a private matter. No comment. As for Andrew, he had multiple surgeries that ended up saving the damaged kidney, stabilized the rib, and restored partial functionality to a testicle. 
There was hope that he would one day achieve an erection, but he may need another surgery and it would likely be painful. For Pete, it had been the longest few weeks of his life. He tried to stay on the road as much as possible. The next several months and into the Thanksgiving holiday were painful as well. He felt physically ill the day that Joan moved out. The breakup of their family unit was worse than when his grandparents died. Eva was at least partially prepared. With what Ricky said, he had planted that seed of doubt, which grew into the truth. She hated what her mom did. Hated it. How could anyone hurt her father like that? Even with her dad being the innocent party, she knew this was going to hurt him for a while. Her mom would be okay. Eva figured she would find some way to justify her actions, or maybe this would kick some sense into her. She would look after her mom, also, and try to forgive her. She knew that it would take a long time for their relationship to recover. Eva had prepped Donnie so that he wasn't completely caught off guard. He was livid with his mother. Being in his last semester at Georgia Tech, meant it was much easier to stay out of the whole mess and duck his mother's phone calls if he wanted to. The whole situation sucked and didn't help the kids with their studies. Even though he got the house and the divorce, with the kids being gone, Pete wondered if he should just sell it. Then the three sisters stepped in to try and cheer him up. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.